to our first installment of ACS Technologies Facility Scheduler Training. This will be the first course we do. My name is Perry Moses. I'm Director of Operations for Alice Drive Baptist Church. And Facility Scheduler is a program that we use that tracks the church calendar, church events, church resources, uh, helps us to track them from an operational standpoint and also helps us to advertise them to the public. We'll start off with logging into the system, how to open it, uh, what the different screens are, how to use them, how to look up events, uh, and cover just the basic viewing and navigating through the program. So let's get started. First thing is on your desktop, you most likely have a facility scheduler icon Mine is here. You may have one down on your taskbar. I have one here. Or you may find it under your start menu. Looks something like this. This is Windows 10. Different operating systems will look a little bit different. For our Macintosh users, uh, you won't have a separate icon for Facility Scheduler. You'll find Facility Scheduler in the ACS on-demand client. Uh, that's how you access Facility Scheduler on a Mac. Um, you can also access it through on-demand on a PC, but I prefer the standalone access here. So when you open Facility Scheduler, you'll come to a screen like this, which is your logon screen. You'll enter your assigned username and password and click logon. And while that's loading, We'll talk about the next screen that comes up. The next screen is going to be what they call the dashboard and facility scheduler. It's kind of a real quick snapshot of things that are still outstanding, what's happening over the next week, and any special notifications. I'll cover each of those sections on this screen. So the first one is action items here. That's your top left corner. And action items are any items that are sitting with an unconfirmed status. So these are all pending items. And they're pending because either we're waiting on forms to come back from groups, uh, we're waiting to confirm that these events are really happening, we don't have all the details on the event yet. Um, the main thing to watch for here is that if you've entered an event a week or so ago and it's still sitting in the pending state, you need to open it up, take a look in the notes, and see if I've put any notes in there, questions, or things we're waiting to answer. Uh, if notes are blank, we're probably waiting on you to put your notes in. So keep an eye for your events that are sitting pending for any length or period of time. The window below is the seven-day outlook. It's a quick way just to see what's coming up real quick. Um, I don't use this a whole lot. I prefer to look at each day at a time. And on the right section is notifications. This is a good one to watch when something new pops up there. Uh, usually uh, when Facility Scheduler puts out an update to their software, they will put a notification here and you can go open and view the release notes. And I uh, would recommend you look at release notes. You may find they've added some new and useful features. So uh, watch for those three sections of the screen. Each section is sizable. You can place your mouse on one of the sizing bars here and make them larger or smaller. So you can configure that however you like to look at it. I like to keep a large action item section. Right, the next area we're going to go, which is the area we use the most, is the calendar. So I'm going to click the calendar button. And depending on how your facility schedule was initially set up, uh, you will want to get it to this view uh, if you're trying to do this along with me in this video. And I'm on day view, so you can click here to get to day view. All right, we're going to talk about the components of this screen. So we're viewing the calendar screen, and in the top left section is a navigable calendar. This is uh, how you get to certain days you want to look at. I'll walk you through that. These are the calendars we're currently viewing. I like to always view all calendars. Um, it is okay if you want to just view a particular ministry's calendar, 
but uh, do not keep that as your default all the time. Uh, it'll help you avoid siloing your ministry if you are always looking at all the events that are happening on our calendar. But if you needed to uh, just view the Kingdom Kids calendar uh, for a project you were working on, it's perfectly fine to just choose one calendar for that purpose. Event details will show the details of a specific event that you have clicked on over here. I'll go ahead and populate this one by clicking on the Kingdom Kids School Days. And here you can see the start and end time, the main booking location, what other bookings there are, and resources. Now the next session is the actual calendar view. We're viewing my calendar the way I like to look at it, which is uh, at the top are events that span more than one day or are considered all-day events. And then we see a timeline, which we can scroll up and down here, that shows me what is happening during the day. There are additional views if you'd like to play with them. Uh, these tabs here will switch between them. Here's an agenda view, a full week view. Occasionally I'll use this month view, but it gets so cramped up it's hard to And then you can view by specific calendar. So here's the college ministry calendar, the communications calendar. I don't use this one much either. Um, but you can play around with your different views. I prefer by day here and day here. Within that area, we will see specific events. Right, so this is Friday, January the 6th. We scroll up and down. We see there's not a whole lot happening on Friday. We do have our Kingdom Kids School program going on. Can click that and see uh, some basic details of that particular event. We also see here's a multi day event up top. This is how Kingdom Kids handles its uh, registration and, and fee payment throughout the year. I'm going to go to a busier day and I'll show you how I'm doing that. I'm looking at the current month here and I want to look at a Sunday, which has got a little more going on. So I'm going to click on Sunday the 8th populates with all the events happening this Sunday the 8th. And we see there up top there are three either all-day or multi-day events. And then there's events occurring at different times. Anytime an event overlaps time frames with another event, it will bump it over to the side. So this will start traveling more and more to the right as more events overlap each other. So that's what you're seeing here. A useful tool that uh, will help you to understand what you're seeing on this screen, all these little icons here mean something, and this legend button will tell you what each of them means. So this is telling me here that Kingdom Kids has registration events, event registration, that VIP ticket sales is a recurring event, that means it happens more than once, worship rehearsals are recurring, Worship is published. Can you see that? Published means that it is on the public calendar, which shows on our website, shows in church life. It's very important when you're creating your events that you check that published checkbox for any events that need to be seen by the public. We can see what primary room numbers are assigned to each of these events. Sometimes we offer room bookings as multiple bookings. So here you can see 104 has been booked for all five of its sections, or six of its sections. But you can book 104 as just an A or an AB. We've created a combination room here of 116, 117. I will warn you, don't always expect when you look at this to say an event is only in that room, for instance. This is booked multiple resources over here. You can see they're booking a car, they're booking child care. They could also have the, the kitchen booked, which they probably should for this event. Um, probably would book the east hallway because this event will pretty much take over the hallway. So this gives you an idea of the main area that an event's happening. But keep an eye on this book. Last thing I want to talk about on this screen is the colors. Uh, 
we've been kind of experimenting with letting um, ministries assign their events to their ministry. And Kingdom Kids is one of those that we've been experimenting with. You can see they're green here. And Kingdom Kids matches a green color here. Most of our events get booked strictly uh, as operations events for their primary. Um, if you would like to assign your events to a particular ministry, for instance, uh, student ministry could assign their events to student ministry. Um, we do use the staff dates. They'll show up orange. Stephanie made a special request for purple for outreach, which she hasn't used it yet. Uh, but if that's something you'd like to do, you can, and that will colorize your calendar. Just make sure that you choose multiple calendars when you create an event and add the operations calendar. Every event should be on operations calendar as well as any other calendars that it belongs to. So that explains the colors here. All right, I'm going to cover how to move around this calendar in, in a sense of days, months, and years. And we're going to do that from this area here. So the, the quick way to move to a day within the current month you're looking at is to just click that day. So we could say, what's happening on January the 18th? I click the 18th. Here's January 18th. Here's what's happening on that day. This is a Wednesday night, so we have a lot of things going on. Here you can see some of the orangey colored staff dates, the green colored kingdom kids. So students, if they wanted to, they could go down and find the uh, student activities uh, and make their primary calendar the student calendar and their events would show up uh, under their name. This is probably, yep, here's the mix, so that would be a student event. All right, the next way you move through, and I don't use this one a lot, but each month can be advanced or uh, moved backwards one increment at a time by clicking the arrow to the right or the arrow to the left. The same thing with year, you can advance a year at a time, go back a year at a time. I will only use this if I move in one or two months. The system can get kind of slow if you try to move a lot of months at one time. Right. I'm going to show you two neat tricks that I do use for navigating the calendar. One is how do I get back to today? So I've advanced here to April and I want to get back to January 6th. I'll click this drop down arrow and at the top of this pop up calendar will always be today's date and you can click on it and it will automatically take you to today's date. I think I have seen some versions that will load this calendar here, but they won't quite take you to today's date. So if it doesn't take you there, you may have to click on the actual day. Today's date will also always be blocked out. So we can see that Friday, January the 6th is highlighted as there. It's telling us that is today's date. And we can click on it to go to it. So let's say you want to go to a date that's a little further away. The best way to do it is to open this drop down. We're going to use this heading right here, which will change as we click on it. So right now it's January 2017. On my first click, it will open a choice of months. These are months within the current year. If we click it again, it will open a choice of years. So let's say we wanted to go to January of 2018. We could get to this point, click 2018, click the month in 2018 we want to go to, and then click the day. So let's say, what does January 6th look like in 2018? So we'll click the 6th, and here's that Saturday. So that's a quick way to move a lot of months at one time. I'm clicking this heading here. Let's see, we're in January 2018. I'm going to click it. I'm going to click it again. I'm going to go back to 2017, and I'm going to look at July. ever want to go back to today, we're going to click that. Right here is our heading for today. We'll click the heading, and we're now back on Friday, January the 6th. So that's a quick way to move through the calendar, through days, months, and 
years. I'm not going to cover this bookings tab. I do want to show you the find event. This is a fairly new feature, very useful. If you know the name of an event, um, for instance, let's say I wanted to find um, something interesting, special needs banquet. I could type in special needs, click show results, and anything in the calendar that has the word special needs in it will show up in the calendar. This is very useful if you want to know when last year's special needs banquet was. We know it was on the 13th. You can double click it and open it from here. I like to find where it is and then go to it on the calendar. And often I will go to this date on the calendar and make a copy of the event if it's very similar and work that copy for the next year's event or, or some future event. So anyway, this is a great way. Find event. to search for an event by name. You can even put in some criteria. You can say, I only want to see... Two thousand sixteen from January the first to let's see, six, this does get a little confusing though. Two thousand sixteen December thirty first. I'm gonna say only show me special needs within the year. And there they are. Great tool, trying to find an event. Uh, the church tracks employees' birthdays, employee hire days. So you can put an employee's name in here and find out their birthday and hire days. Um, anytime you're searching an event, a great way to do it. I'm going to go back to calendar here. Uh, I want to tell you about this refresh button. So ACS Facility Scheduler, uh, your calendar on your computer is not constantly pushed updates. So if I were sitting here looking at Friday, and someone else added a Friday event, it's not going to just show up on my screen. I would have to hit the refresh button, which would refresh all the data in the calendar. So that would also include if somebody was in here and they added an event to Sunday, the calendar is not going to always show me they just added this recent event. So always a good idea to refresh it uh, during times when we know we're kind of actively working on the calendar or if you're working on an event with person at the same time that uh, the two of you are keeping things refreshed. Uh, I would not recommend you have a single event open on two computers at the same time. That could get a little squirrely. Uh, I will walk you through what these two tabs are up here briefly. The reports tab is used for generating custom reports. It also is a good tool for doing kind of high-level advanced finds. I will probably cover that in another course, um, how to really find things that are more difficult than what you can find in that little find button. And I'll just show you the screen really quick. Um, we do keep one report in here. Um, Richard, which is my Sunday employee, uh, every Friday afternoon, Jason will run this report, which gives Richard a printout of everything that's happening on Sunday and Monday so we can go through and, and kind of give him a, a work list for Sundays when he's here. So that's one way we use reports. Uh, the church also will run a, a room booking report for a conference room and stick that on the door so people can just look at it and know if the conference room has been booked. And there's several other neat things to do in here. We'll cover that in more detail later. And then an administration tab, this is mostly for administering facility scheduler, administering users, uh, resources, things of that sort. So I don't think you'll do much in the administration tab. I'm going to go back to the calendar tab here. Just leave this kind of familiar graph. Okay, next I want to look at an actual event and see how these events are booked. I'm going to open this Sunday, January 8th, Women's Study Life Group in 222. When you first click on an event, the system's going to look and say, is this a recurring event, meaning it happens multiple times, uh, or is it just a single occurrence? 
and it, in this case, is a uh, recurring event, and it's going to ask me, do I want to just edit the one occurrence, or do I want to edit the whole series? And in this case, I'm going to edit just the occurrence. And if I actually made a change to this occurrence and saved it, it would be pulled out of the recurring schedule and would become a single event. So do be aware of that as you're editing. We're just going to talk about the basics of this screen today. On the main event tab, which is what it opens to, is the name of our event, the calendar that it's been assigned to, its current status, and you remember we looked at the legend, when you add a new event, it's going to go on as pending. Once I've had a chance to review it and say, yes, this can happen, we know all we need to know, I'll confirm it. The publish box is whether it's viewable on public calendars like Church Life and our website. The start time of the event, both date and time, end time, date and time. If it was an all-day event, you would check this box, book it as an all-day event. We'll cover setup and tear down another session. What primary location has been booked for this event? We don't use tags, we don't use the image. The event description uh, we do use, and it's important that you use this properly, this is for describing your event in a means that you would be uh, comfortable with the public reading and also giving good information to the public so they know what the event is about, uh, any details that they need to know besides date, time, ring number. The next tab is bookings. Under bookings, you'll see our primary location here. It will also show up down here in event resources. This top section didn't really change when we went to bookings. Bookings handles all the resources that are needed to put on this event. And this event uses a single resource, which is a room, um, but it could use multiple rooms. It can use uh, facilities like the kitchen. Um, it could use things like a large whiteboard, uh, reserve TV cart, anything of that sort would show up here. This is where you book your resources. The next button we're going to go to is attachments. We don't use attachments much, but if you wanted to attach, for instance, a drawing or a picture to an event, this would be the place to do it. I do ask that if you attach something here that you want operations to be looking at, to please make a note of it in the notes tab that uh, you've attached something here and what it is. So we'll know to go look there. And the notes tab is where we're heading next. So I'm going to click on notes. Notes is very important. Notes is what we use. Uh, this is an internal field. It's not used for the public. This tells us what all we need to know is going on with your event. What do you need? What kind of setup? any information that would be helpful to us to make your event a success. As you can see that uh, Mary has put in a one-line request here for what she needs for this Women's Study Life Group. Um, when I cover training on how to enter a new event, I'm going to show you a template that I want you to use that kind of ask a bunch of questions that we may or may not need answers to. Um, that gives you a little more formal what what do we really mean in the notes section? All right. Save and close. If I had made a change that I want to save, I would click that before I leave. If I'm just looking at an event and I don't need to save any changes, don't click save and close, please. It will generate an email to me that you've edited an event. Just close the event with the close button. So that's the save and close button. When you want to save your changes, click this next one, multiple calendars, is used when you need to book an event on more than just the operations calendar. For instance, if Mary, who set up this event, wanted the Women's Study Life Group to be on uh, the Compass and other communications, she could click the communications calendar and add it to that, and that would tell our communications department that there's an event that Mary would like advertised. 
It doesn't tell communications much more than that, but at least gets it on your calendar. If you are trying to colorize and isolate your ministry, you could have your primary calendar be your ministry's calendar. Just for fun, we'll play with this one. Um, let's say this is a. I don't have a great fit for this one, but uh, we say this is a college ministry event. If you do that, make sure you always have operations as an additional calendar, and it will show up right here. And that way we'll always know what's going on with all the different ministries. But we've now colorized and assigned women's study life group to a particular ministry. Uh, this probably would belong better in maybe an adult ministry category that we don't have. So if there are categories you would like for ministry, let me know. We can try to work with you on that. Um, this is something fairly new. We've been beta testing it for probably a year or so now. Um, it seems to be working. So just let me know. I'm not going to save my changes, so I'm not going to set this one back. Uh, event type, probably don't really need to cover today, but these, we'll cover this when you're creating a new event. Um, enable registration is kind of the same thing. If it's an event that people will register for, that would show up. And you could print the event details if you wanted to. That should not be real commonly done. Down at the very bottom of your screen, I'll cover this. This shows when the event was created and by whom. You can see Mary Johnson made this on the 4th of January. And you can see when it was last modified. It doesn't tell us who modified it, but it does tell us when it was last modified. That is the basics of what is in an events uh, window. I'm going to close this without saying it's going to warn me. Do I, I've made changes. Don't want to say no. It's going to return us back to our screen. And uh, we could go to the next event or move on. Um, at this point, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about some experiences with Facility Schedule 1. Um, it's a little bit slow to load, so I'd recommend uh, for me when I come in in the morning. And that's one of my applications. I just click on to open. I, I open my Outlook, my Evernote, and the facility scheduler when I crank up my computer. Um, facility scheduler has a fairly new feature where it will time you out after inactivity. I don't know exactly how long it is. I'd say it's a few hours. Um, it is perfectly fine to leave facility scheduler open and you can minimize it to the background. Um, but I would recommend if you've been away from your computer for a while, and you want to do something in Facility Scheduler, to bring it up, hit this refresh button. That will do two things. It'll go refresh any new content that people may have added or changed. And it will also tell you if the system has timed out. And if it has, normally it'll close itself. If it doesn't, you'll need to close it and reopen Facility Scheduler and log back in. But I will typically leave this open all day. I just minimize it to the background hit refresh when I want to come back and use it. And if it's timed out on me, I reopen it. Uh, I'm going to stop with that for today. And uh, probably next lesson we'll be adding an event. We'll go through uh, finding where to put your event on the calendar and how to put in the details and get it added. I appreciate you watching this video. Please uh, comment below any questions you have, any feedback, anything that you'd like added to the training or see you in the future. Hope you have a wonderful day.